Hello everybody, this is Kyle with Kyle's Corner here, talking to you today with Noah Lesh from <laughs> Global Wines. We're gonna be talking about our upcoming wine tasting. Uh, actually, while you're watching this, you're in the wine tasting right now. <laughs> so what can you tell us about the wines we're about to taste, Noah? Hey, th thanks Kyle. Uh, first, I just wanna say a little bit about Global Wines what, and what we're all about. We, we like to get small production wines from around the world in here in the United States and then and we, we bring them here to Iowa where you know you're not always able to get these smaller wines. We, we like to go find those diamonds in the rough. One of those we found that we're talking about today is Quarissa. We're out of South Australia. There's a young man down there named Johnny Quarissa. Johnny's been making wine there for about 20 years. He started this, he started his winery about five years ago. We've got two of his wines here. So we've got the Johnny Q and the Mrs. Q wines. We're doing a couple of Shirazes. We're doing a Petit Syrah and we're doing a Cabernet Sauvignon. Very cool. Now, for the folks at home who don't know, Petit Syrah, Syrah, Shiraz, what's the relation in those grapes? So, you know what? I, I get that question a lot. And, and some of you guys might have that question too. So here, here's the thing. There's no difference. Syrah you get around the world. Petit Syrah is, is a little bit different. And a lot of people will, will like to confuse those two. Petit Syrah, except in the United States, is known as a grape called Derif, which was the grape that was that was found in the 1850s in France. Started with the Syrah plant, they they pollinated it with some other grapes, came up with an entirely new grape. And it was uh, Monsieur Derif came up with this grape and, and they've called it Derif ever since. It's a big, dark, inky, delicious grape, very different from the, from the other Syrah. You mentioned the Derif. Uh, a lot of wines I've found out while studying wine now are named completely different things depending upon where you're at in the world. <laughs> absolutely, yeah, absolutely. All the time. So some have 10, 15, 20 names, uh, depending on where you're at. Italy, right, is very, very <laughs> well known for taking a well-known grape and then... <laughs> and absolutely, then. absolutely. Uh, Spain does the same thing. We do it here in the United States as oh, well. Yeah, for sure. With, with Petit Sera as a prime example of that, we're almost the only ones who call it Petit Sera. Hmm. Well, let's tell folks at home too about, uh, so now Kunawara is where you said this is located. Yes. Where their winery is located. Now, can you give that to folks uh, in relation to the whole of Australia? Absolutely. Like in, I'm gonna mind the shape of Australia for you folks at home. There's the south of Australia. New Zealand's over here somewhere, right? It's near Melbourne and it's near Sydney. It's about, it's a few hundred miles from Sydney and about a hundred miles from Melbourne, a little bit inland, but it's in that same South Australia where most of their grapes come from. Cool, so let's talk about how we're tasting these wines today because uh, for the folks at home, they are going to be tasting these uh, in the order we give them. So we have our wine bags for you guys at home that you'll be tasting from. Now, disregard the fact that <laughs> I have a white and a rosé here because this is just for visual purposes because all these are red. I didn't want to confuse you. So our number one wine uh, we're going to be tasting today, we're going to start with... We're going to start with the, the Johnny Q Shiraz. But the Johnny Q Shiraz is their, uh, is their entry level Shiraz. He, he was nice enough to, to have the premium stuff named after his wife. So you'll see it nice, robust flavors, big dark cherry, big dark plum flavors. Um, I, I, I like to start with the Shiraz. It's not quite as intense as the Petit Syrah. I like to start with the, the lowest body to the heaviest body. These are very similar in body, so we'll uh, we'll kind of go from there. But when the first thing I get is that big, big dark cherry. Definitely dark red Southern. fruit. Salute to you too. Now, if you guys at home are catching me do that, <laughs> I apologize if you think it's rude. It's something that we do in the wine trade to incorporate some oxygen into the wine and it helps get more of those flavors, activates some of those phenols, brings out more of that, the essence of the wine. It makes it sound goofy too, so it's fun at parties. Hey, I paired some cheeses for you folks at home. Our new cheeses of the month for you today. Those cheeses are from a really cool little place in Virginia. Meadow Creek Dairy is the name of it and they are producing some really neat raw cow's milk cheeses. So I decided to do a wash rind cheese for you to start off fairly mild and nutty, really allows some of the grasses that are fed to these cows, uh, which are wild range cows. These guys are just let free and they move them to different pastures depending on the time of the season uh, to get fresh grass. This cheese is gonna have that beautiful light nutty flavor. And I think these dark kind of cherry essences you were talking about, like kind Absolutely. of that, that dark red fruit goes great with that cheese. So you'll see that as the, the wash rind cheese has this kind of mellow, orange outside texture. It's beautiful, creamy, 
body to the cheese. Uh, fantastic for this. Nice. Oh, that, that looks phenomenal. Yeah. And one, one thing I, I love about Australian Shiraz is, is, is it's just big and fruity and jammy, and, and, and that essence makes it go so well with those creamy cheeses. All right. Now we're moving on to wine number two. For the wine number two. So, we, so we, we're doing the... Petite Syrah, this is the Johnny Q Petite Syrah. This is gonna be a little bit darker. It's that big, dark, inky wine. That's what Petite Syrah is known for. I know you folks at home have your wine glasses <laughs> up and you're looking through the light, you're doing all the same stuff, but that, that dark, beautiful, dark color <laughs> is something that you don't get with some of the more widely drank wines, I'd say. But Petite Syrah is a little more niche. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And it, it's used a lot, a lot of times as a blending grape, but we're starting to see a little bit more on stand on its own, which, which is great. When I drink pizza, I always think blueberries. It's that big, big, dark, heavy blueberries. I wanted to bring up how you see pizza used a lot in blending. Uh, it's often used to kind of ground the wine, give it that... that... It, it, to use ground the wine, and, and people love the color. They love getting that dark color. So sometimes you'll you'll just see, you know, 3% pizza raw or four. They're, they're really, just, when you get 10, 11, 12%, you're really getting that that big earthy essence out of the petite syrah. Yes, bit of a bit more acidity to it as well. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So this is what I want to do for you folks at home with the petite syrah. Uh, I gave you a beautiful, rich, fatty cut of beef to enjoy with this. This is our uh, Metro Deli uh, pastrami. So this has been uh, smoked and brined. This pastrami has a beautiful pepper quality to it. Yes. And I just thought with that petite syrah, the acidity will cut through the fat. Uh, I thought it'd be a great option for you at home to enjoy with a little bit of bread. Helps get through some of the richness of the wine too. Yeah, with the, the fattiness of the beef and that little bit of pepper mm -hmm. will set it off perfect. One thing I enjoy doing with beef like this is getting an au jus. And oftentimes in my au jus, I will add a touch of red wine. Oh, sure. Uh, just when I go to cook it, it just adds a little bit of fruitiness, a little bit of earthiness in some cases. It brings out all that beautiful beef flavor too. So now we're, we're trying our third wine. This is our second Shiraz. And the, this Shiraz actually comes from, it's a little bit more of a defined area, the McLaren Vale, which is down in the Adelaide area. A little, little bit further south than, than the Kumara area, where, where the original one was just from South Australia, so it's sort of from, you know, taken taken from a few different vineyards. They, this is taken from a very specific location. It's like the difference between a California wine and a Napa Valley wine. We've got a more specific location, and, and the McLaren Vale is really known for the Shiraz. Neil, you have to help me out with this one because we're in the Southern Hemisphere. So moving further south, we're getting cooler, right? Absolutely. That's the only really area of Australia that you can grow nice grapes is because up, up north it's way too hot. And for you at home too, one of the things about wine that we sometimes forget, sugar can be to the benefit or the detriment of the wine. You get a lot of sugar, that means there's a lot of food for the yeast to act on. Yeast produce alcohol and carbon dioxide. Right. We enjoy one of those things a <laughs> lot in wine. Sometimes the other one too, you get uh, bubbly wines from that. But that being said, you move to a cooler climate, you get a bit more acidity usually, uh, yeah, a little less sugar. Yeah, absolutely. You're, 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 getting, you're picking the grapes when they're a little less ripe and so, you, so you're gonna get higher acidity and, and you're, you're gonna get more of the soil coming out. You know, another thing you get is thicker skins. And so it takes a little longer to penetrate everything. And that's a lot of times you get that richer, deeper flavor. Now, one thing too, I'm gonna to remind everyone at home, we're enjoying just about a half ounce to an ounce on each of these that's wines. Right. I've given you about four to five ounces each. <laughs> you can feel free to pause this video at any time. You don't have to drink at the same speed we are. Uh, For sure. So yeah, one thing I'm noticing about this, getting a bit more expression of the skin of the fruit. Yes, absolutely. I'm thinking up on it. I, absolutely, and, and you can definitely tell that it's more intense flavor. Then the, the Johnny Q, the, the Johnny Q's nice. It's just got a little more depth going on, a little more texture to it. And I think that's that's nice too, because again, this is a great segue into my cheese. <laughs> so I picked the Appalachian cheese for you guys to try uh, along with this one. The Appalachian is again, a raw cow's milk cheese produced in Virginia. This cheese is again, going to express some of the nuttiness of the natural grasses that are occurring. But the aging process they use on this cheese is reminiscent of some old European techniques and it produces this beautiful funk to it. Think of it almost like a blue cheese without the uh, penicillium inoculation. So you're not getting all the blue veins and that kind of uh, moldy funk to it, but you're getting some of that sharp, beautiful brightness. And I thought uh, going with a rustic style wine like Absolutely. this one, that, 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 that sounds amazing. That yeah. sounds amazing with this uh, with this syrup. We'll be eating this afterwards. Shiraz. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing I, I really like to do with Shiraz particularly 
is uh, I, I like game meat. I, I like fowl yes. with uh, doing with Shiraz. And some people might think that Shiraz is going to be a little too heavy, but I think I think it goes with the gaminess of of any. You can do Cornish hens. You can any kind of if you're doing duck. Any I'm any just of that sort of duck. It, <laughs> any, any, any kind of game fowl with, with the Shiraz or Petit Shiraz, phenomenal. And the cab might be a little too heavy for those. Sure. Um, you know, but then again, with cab, you can do any of your grilled meats that, that, that you're doing right now. When, when people are asking me about pairings, and people are always looking for Cabernet Sauvignon, they're, they're looking for things to pair. I oftentimes I will steer them away from the Cabernet into the Shiraz, mm. and because I Shiraz is kind of like Cabernet with all without all the tannic. It's got the big fruit. It's got the it's got the, the high level of uh, complexity to it. And it just doesn't have that tannin that sometimes will, will get in the way of, if your food's not the, the biggest, boldest food, Syrah is a perfect accompaniment, perfect red wine for, for any food. And I love to just grill veggies and, and drink uh, and drink Syrah. That, that's, that's one of my favorite things to do. All right, let's move on to the All Cabernet. right, and, and we, so we've got number four, and then this is, uh, it's Cabernet Sauvignon. It, it's the king of all the reds. You get Cabernet Sauvignon from every region of the world, really. And, and there, there, there's a reason. Um, it, it's easy to grow, but sometimes it's hard to grow perfectly. And so different regions definitely do different things with it. And this, this is, actually comes out of uh, Kanawara. And I, I, think, I think it's a beautiful, beautiful, uh, it's got a little spice note to it, but it's not quite as tannic as some of the, say, Northern California or, or even some of the French Cabernet Sauvignons that, that, that you'll get. It's definitely got a character all its own that's, that's the Australian Cabernet. Now, one thing we haven't touched on with the Shiraz and the Petit Syrah that I think we could address with this, oftentimes American Cabernets are very heavily oaked. Yes. Uh, they undergo a heavy oak treatment. Can you talk to kind of the treatment of oak on yeah, this? Yeah, it certainly gets oaked, and, and oftentimes they'll, they'll use French or American oak. And, and they, this is a combination of the two, particularly Napa Valley Cabernets. They'll, they'll get oaked for up to 28 months at a time. We're, we're talking more 12 to 18 months here. So it sees the oak, and, and it definitely gets the uh, it gets the flavor, but it doesn't. it's not real heavy-handed with it. Which, which is a thing I, I personally enjoy. Some people like a lot of oak. I, I like it a little bit less. I gotta say this, I have gum, I've come to I've gum. I have gum at home. Um, I've come to appreciate oak more and more in its nuanced use and in whiskey. <laughs> that's, I think that's sure the enough, sure difference enough. for me. Wine, let's be judicial about it. Let's not get too carried away with and, the wine. And you, you can definitely taste the oak in here. You get a little bit of that vanilla. Vanilla is a sure sign of, of oak. For you folks at home, with a Chardonnay that's heavily oaked, you're often going to get that presence of baking spice. Um, you're often going to get that kind of, like you said, vanilla. Mm -hmm. In the case of Cabernet, I think it often expresses itself almost as a brambly. I think of like wild berries and how sometimes you'll get a, a, a twig or a stem in there. Absolutely. And if you chew on that, all of a sudden you get that that uh, phenol. It's actually a chemical compound. Sure. That's and all of a sudden, you're, oh, that's wood. <laughs> well, it's bitter when you try it yeah. straight off the, the vine, as they say. But when it comes to uh, being in a barrel. Well, and and you, you give it some time to age, and it, yeah. it definitely all smooths out in, into that nice, luxurious Cabernet Sauvignon that, that, we all, that, that we all drink and we all love. And not to be a shameless plug for our restaurant that's associated <laughs> with the market, but I was gonna bring up pasta too. Oh, sure. Um, the Cavatelli that we do, actually we do here in the market, we do it at the Urban Grill as well. Um, but to me, I was thinking of this cab because beautiful, dark, cherry flavor but there's just enough oak to kind of give me that almost a semblance of like a sweet tomato like it go with sweet tomato absolutely in some ways we got some really heavy pork in there too I think oh yeah that, that sounds too. amazing yeah why don't you order a couple of those for us let's now do, i've got some over here let's do it <laughs> i love that for sure um this cabernet by the way everyone at home it's got a wine enthusiast 93 point score maybe you can talk to that some of the awards they've gotten for these bottles well, because sure they're not slouches by any no absolutely all of these wines are, are 90 plus wine enthusiasts they've all been they've all gotten 90 plus uh, from the canter which the, the sort of the european publication that, that, that does a lot of these rating systems and, and ratings are nice because you've got someone that's that's been in the business for a while and they, they sort of get a chance to tell you what they think anything 90 and above is excellent 90 and above is excellent. There's not a single bottle up here that's not 90 or above. <laughs> <laughs> there, And this is the thing for me too, these are value. Looking at wines that are right in the 15 to $16 range, 
Uh, if you buy them at home with the order sheet included with your tasting kit, you get 10% off oh, the nice. first two bottles nice. and up. So any same. two bottles plus, 10% off if same. you come with an order same, sheet. Same. So you're getting 93 point wine for 14 bucks, 13 bucks or whatever. Yeah. That's, that's a steal from, from anywhere. I'm giving them away. Um, so what we, <laughs> what we can talk about next too, we've got some awesome wines, great scores, delicious. Let's talk about the screw caps. Screw, screw, screw caps. caps are the thing. The screw caps are the wave of the future. I, I know in the past, a lot of people looked at screw caps and they kind of you kind of saw them on the bottom shelf. And that's kind of the way it was. And, and sort of winemakers put the their- The were low. Wine, winemakers put their, their worst wines in the screw caps. That, that is no longer the case. For one thing, the world's running out of cork. And it takes 90 years to, from a sapling to, to full growth for a cork tree to grow. Well, no one wants to do that because it's not happening in their lifetime. So no one wants to put the money in so their grandkids can get paid off. Now we've got synthetic corks, which are fine, but we've, we, we've gotten the, the stealth enclosures, which, which is sort of the, uh, is the industry term for, for screw cap. If it's over $15, it's a stealth enclosure. If it's under $15, it's a screw cap. Yeah. That's, that's, that's the, way, the way we always do it. The great thing about them is they preserve the wine so well especially with wines that you're gonna drink now. 99% of wines that go on the shelf are wines that you're buying to drink in the next year. You're not sitting and laying them down for the next right. 20 years. Those, those wines that you do wanna lay down, you definitely wanna cork in because you're getting no air in these. But that's the great thing about wines that you wanna drink now is that you get no air. So that, and that's really why screw tops are taking over. I see it more and more with domestic wines. And I, I've had a few folks in my time in the business saying, ah, oh, screw top, really? Um, but honestly, folks, uh, for a daily drinker, even for a special occasion wine, honestly, you get almost, I want to say it's something like 99% uh, efficiency with the screw top. Sure. As in, believe it or not, corks fail 20% of the time. Yeah, absolutely. And I've had so many cork <laughs> bottles. And you, you will never ever get a cork yeah. bottle from a screw cap. If you have a special occasion, you don't want to worry about a bottle being bad, go with the screw top. Even the really nicer ones are starting to, some of them are starting to switch over to screw tops. And, and really, particularly Australia, South Africa, those were two big areas that uh, that adopted the screw tops really early, mm -hmm. and they're almost all in on them right now. This is a fun little trick I learned. <laughs> you twist the neck, if you want to look fancy at your party, mm -hmm. and you're trying to impress guests, do that. It just, I don't know, it adds a little extra something, something. So here, here's the thing I learned as a server when, when I was just getting in, because I, I had a hard time with these screw tops. Yeah. To, to make it look nice, like crank yeah, on, crank you're, on. Yeah. And, what I learned is if you hold it down here and turn it up here, you get yeah. a lot more leverage. There's that, that, too, that, yeah. that, that, that was my That's big way to do it. That was my big key. I'd get so frustrated with the screw tops. First sum um, I ever studied under, he he made the point that, okay, you want to keep the label pointed towards the guest at all times. Absolutely. But if you add the combo, no, I, I, oh, I like you reveal trick. it. You reveal it to the customer. <laughs> hey, there it is. <laughs> so um Noah, thank you so much. If you folks have any questions with the terminology that we're using today, don't hesitate to put it down in the comments below. I will answer those. Uh, we're going to be doing this as an interactive thing. So any questions about tannins, any questions about oak aging, uh, when we talked about French versus American oak, uh, that could be an entire video in and of itself, and it will be eventually. We're gonna be doing these every week now. Um, so yeah, feel free to ask questions on those. We will answer them. And we're gonna give you all the knowledge we have on on why, <laughs> on life. Well, hey, thanks thanks for having me here. I really you know appreciate thank it. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Cheers to everyone. Folks, have a great weekend. <laughs> thank you so much for uh, getting your wine kits with us, and we'll look forward to seeing you in the market. All right, Take enjoy care. your wines. Thank you. That uh, 